Today, we're here with the brand new Gordon Murray Automotive T33. And a very pretty car it is, I think you'll agree. There are all sorts of hints of 60s sports cars in there. It reminds me a little bit of a Porsche 904, one of my favorite looking cars of all time. But I admit when I heard that Gordon was producing another car, I was a little bit confused. It's coming very hard on the heels of the T50, which I thought might be his last. And that was an easy car to understand. It was an update of the F1 with all the sort of experience of 30 years, new manufacturing methods, new materials. An update of that car is easy to understand. But what's this? If you just look at the facts and figures, then the T33 appears to be surprisingly similar to the T50. Carbon chassis, double wishbone suspension, and a naturally aspirated 3.9 litre mid-mounted V12 driving the rear wheels. It's down on revs and power, but only by a bit. 607 brake horsepower and an 11,100 RPM redline aren't too shabby. Weight is up too, but again, not by much the T33 tipping the scales at just 1,090 kilos. It measures just 49 millimetres longer overall, a mere 35 millimetres longer in wheelbase, and it's an identical width. So, is this a two-seat T50 without a fan? Or are there fewer similarities than the specs suggest? There's only one person to ask about all this, isn't there? It's Gordon himself. Just in case you're not familiar with Professor Gordon Murray CBE, he is a collector of t-shirts, a jukebox fanatic, a soapbox race organiser, a Bob Dylan aficionado, and designer of some of the most famous race and road cars ever, amongst other things. And at 75 years young, he doesn't appear to be slowing down. So why did you want to make T33? That was very much a sort of a what do we do next? Because 50 is so extreme, and, and, and the things that put it to one side, you, you, you know, we just, it'll sit, sit there forever, hopefully. That's the central driving position, sub 1,000 kilos and 12,000 revs. I mean, that, it sits up on a pedestal. So what do you do after that? Well, we're supercar manufacturers. Um, why don't we do a more conventional mid-rear engine motor car, but make that the best one of its type sort of thing? Um, so that was the decision. We did, we did consider a, a lot of other, other layouts and other cars but it seemed logical that because T50 was so extreme and so special that the next one would should be something a little bit more conventional if you like um, than 50. So the price is it's, it's obviously below T, T50? It's 1.37 it's a long way below yeah so it's 1.37 so it's just a bit over half a T50. So I suppose where have you cost cut it? <laughs> well, there hasn't been any cost cutting. I think it's really important to point out one of our seven principles is engineering art. And once again, the attention to detail and the materials, there's no plastic, everything's machined from solid. We get the uh, price point from two, uh, two benefits. The first one is, of course, T50 bore the brunt of the engine development uh, and the transmission development and the electrical architecture, which is hugely expensive all that sort of stuff uh, and, and a lot of smaller things too like the air conditioning development and you know, right down to the switch gear I mean the switch gear on T50 with the bill, the bill for just those two and that was 1.3 million pounds so although we'll have different front ends the back end of the switch will be the same there's very few carryover parts but that's one of them uh, the second benefit comes from the fact we're doing 300 cars off one platform and if you think about that, so from the point of view of suspension, brakes, uprights, you know, that sort of stuff, it would have different wheels and things, obviously. The one thing I promise people categorically is that they will be very different motor cars. They won't be just the, this 33 with a, you know, a lift out roof panel or something like that. It'll be a very different motor car. Right, so we're not just looking at discrete variants of I mean it's going to be this family but it will be a very the three variants will be very different so this particular variant the first one is the closest cousin will ever make to T50 right. so fixed head coupe that B12 in the back manual gearbox and only a hundred cars so that's the closest this one is the closest we'll ever make to 50 the others will vary quite a bit Another really important point is the fact that this will be our last non-hybrid car. 
So as much as we can hold on, being small, flexible, and only having a 36-month cycle time for a product, we can hold on to a V12 much longer than a bigger company can, and we can be the last little flag waving. But nevertheless, we've worked out that the next, so project three, let's call it, will have to be a hybrid. Our promise to people, though, is whether it's hybrid or even full electric one day, we'll always make the lightest, the best engineers and the most fun to drive. That's where we, we are coming from. So in, in terms of the, sort of the driving, is it going to be, is it still that, is it, is it more GT? Is it more sports car? Is yeah, I don't like the GT. I know there was mention on GT in one of our early press things, but I, I think I, I, I sit, sits uncomfortably with me with a mid-rear engine car. You know, the thing's got a better powder weight ratio than a McLaren F1. It's not really GT. It was more about the opportunity to do this architecture, but in a car I've had in my head for 25 years, from a styling point of view. I've always wanted to do a car that uses all the 60s, in, I mean, grew up with the 60s, of course, and, and sports cars, but also sports racing cars, my favorites from that period, which are still gorgeous today, you know, like the 206 Dino SP and the, the Mura and the 33 Stradale and the, the Vallelunga, Di Tommaso Vallelunga, but some of the Porsches, the 904s, 906s, 908s, cars like that. So I'd always wanted the opportunity to do that. And with 50, uh, like the F1, you can't because the central driving position pushes the pedals forward about 280 mil. So it's a very forward cabin look, and you can't do a, a sort of a classic looking car. It's more sort of spaceship type forward cabin. And with T50, we decided to go even more extreme and we moved the screen forward another 30 mil from the F1. So it's even more forward cabin with a very short bonnet. So these proportions just don't work really. But once you've moved the driver back outside the wheel arches again, you know, um, you can go back to the sort of 60s classic proportions. But the last thing we wanted to do was a retro car. You know, I, I, don't, I just don't like that idea very much. <laughs> um, so it was really just using those proportions and those influences and doing a brand new, crisp, modern, very clean motor car. And the team I'm working with now are probably the best I've ever worked with, both on the engineering side, but also the styling studio. We have a tiny team of people. Kevin Richards and myself, my creative director, we've worked together for 27 years, so we know exactly how we, th we think. And, uh, and we have a very small team of very talented people in the studio, so it was quite easy to get my early sketches started on, on what was uh, to become the 33. You know. and, and what are the things that you're thinking about and aiming for in a design? Because it's easy to say, sort of, I think everybody understands the whole the 60s, beautiful cars, but then with your eye, yeah. what, what makes them beautiful and what have you tried to include in this? Well, it's, it's two big things. First thing is proportion. The proportion with, uh, with these cars is absolutely everything. You know, the, the classic rules like with a rear mid-engine car, you have a long front overhang and a very short rear overhang with a front engine car. It's the other way around, for example. Once you break those rules, you're never going to get anything pretty. Um, and if you look at all the 60s cars, it's, they're very much like that. It's then about classic shapes, you know, not trying too hard. Because we're a really small company, uh, we can fly in the face of current style and current trends, if you like, and that's exactly what we do. There seems to be a sort of race on at the moment between supercar manufacturers to make the next one more outrageous than the last one. So we've stuck to classic form as well as proportion. So if you look at, if you look at 33, the, the, the muscles over the front and rear haunches and the little pinch line and stuff like that. We wanted to keep a little bit of GMA DNA, a little bit of 50 DNA there, but we didn't want to do another T50. So it has got a few little, uh, little bits and pieces, if you like, from, from GMA DNA. Things like the headlamps are a very really good example. If you look at 60s cars, they were all one above the other and the graphic for the headlamps was always quite long and narrow and it always ran right down to the front opening. Um, if you look at any of the cars, the Vallelunga, you know, any of the Dinos, um, that was very much uh, a signature, if you like. The same on the rear of the car, all these modern humps, humps and curves and things, they were, they were quite linear at the back, quite simple and mechanical. And, you know, LED lights, now, these days, just because you can, people 
It drives me. It's the worst thing on modern cars for me is, is the LED lights, you know, stuff that's going to look awful in 10 years' time. Um, so sticking to something very technical and round like we have on the rear and not introducing too many open ducts and slots where you don't need them. I think one, one of the great lessons from the 60s is there's nothing on this car that, that doesn't have a function. So there's nothing there for just styling's sake, whereas that's the absolute opposite. On, on even some of this sort of um, older OEM, supercar OEMs that should know better now, there's stuff appearing all over the place that has no aerodynamic function whatsoever. One of the things I noticed is the, the, the lovely creases along the, the top of the Yeah, arches. that's a sort of signature really. We've got, we've got a bit of that on 50, but we've, we've accentuated it even more on this. Because it sort of runs down almost through the light, doesn't it? It, it does. It actually runs, if you look closely, it runs into the light lens. It, it washes out a bit because you're not allowed to have a crease right in front of the trajectory from the, from the lamp unit. Um, but then it picks up again in front. I suppose it's sort of the, in terms of the design details, big big area of glass for the for the windscreen yep. as well, which gives a lovely sort of. Well, it's got a very low scuttle. F1 and 50 have probably the lowest scuttle of any supercar, and yet well, you've driven an F1. You can see the road. It's like it's like a PlayStation, isn't it? You can see the road right in front of you, and this has got exactly the same scuttle height. So it's more to do with the, the size of the windscreen. It's more to do with the scuttle height than anything else. And obviously then we've got this sort of this band over the top um, of the car, it's almost a sort of a slight sort of target yeah, sort of uh, look to it. We've learned so much since we've done this car actually. The, the vision I had for the car was of what you're looking at, where you have uh, the, the roll hoop, let's call it, and the air box, uh, all in body colour. And that was what I had in my head when I started styling. However, our, we've got some very clever guys on, um, on the rendering. Of the, of the car, you know, and doing graphics and stuff and putting it up on the screen. And uh, George, who's our wizard, he started playing with uh, different colours and wow, you know, Kevin and I were just looking at it and saying, it just changes the car completely. We're going to have so much fun specking these cars because if you take that rollover bar and make it carbon, it's all carbon underneath anyway, the whole body's carbon. You make that carbon and make the airbox carbon so you get a complete greenhouse, black, Make, looks like a completely different motor car. But then the even better one is if you had, if you imagine that car's a bright blue or red or whatever, and then you put a silver rollover bar, it's got a very targa look. And then you could have the airbox body color or the airbox carbon. And we started playing, <laughs> just started playing on the screen. And it, it makes the car look so different, which I, it wasn't part of my plan at all. You know, I, I planned it like that. I want to get onto the engineering side of it. I know you love the design as much as the engineering, um, but before we do that, T33, why 33? When we started the GMD 15 years ago, um, we were up to T24 in my car, so the first car we did was naturally T25. It just means type, basically, and nothing new. And um, we've roughly been chronological in dishing out numbers. However, um, there's, the sh there's a short and long story. The short story is, once again, Kev Richards and myself sat down and looked at all the numbers when we started GMP and there were a few numbers we just liked and, and banked. You know, it's very much like um, somebody like Ducati picking 888 or 916 or whatever. They're just numbers sound good. And 33 we liked, so we banked that for something one day. We banked 50, of course, and a couple of others which will appear later. As we got towards talking about celebrating 50 years with a, with a motor car, 2017, we were already doing T47 and T49, so it was logical that we use 50. That's the short version. The longer version is, uh, going way back, I had this romantic notion that one day I'd like to do a little sports car, and it had to have a small capacity V12. This is long before T50. And, um, Romantically, I just thought 3.3 litres, what about a 3.3? Four litres even seemed too big for me, a 3.3 litre. And, you know, we, we pushed around a few ideas, but then when we got towards 2017, and, and in fact 2018, at the end of 18, was the first time I sat down with Cosworth to talk about a V12. And I, I put on the table a 3.3. But I said the car would have to have more push than a McLaren F1. I didn't want to go backwards, you know. And it would have to feel better than an F1. 
They calculated we'd have to make the car under 900 kilos to do that with 3.3. Uh, we had a quick sit down, we decided with, with air con and airbags and everything these days we were never going to get more than 900 kilos. So we did a bit of reverse engineering, said well what can we build a car to? And we reckoned a thousand kilos was doable. So we went back to Cosworth and they did the sums and they said well then you need a, a four litre to be quicker than a, an F1. Um, and that's how it happened, so the 33 sort of it, we just pulled it back out of the bank because we just liked the number, but it was going to be for the engine capacity. Like a 250 LM, I think, had 3.3 Colombo V12, didn't it, I think? Yes, they did go up to 3.3, that's right. That's right. Well, the 330s they called them, didn't they? Yeah. That leads us on to the engine because it's obviously closely related to the T50 engine, but it's different. It's the same and it isn't. It's certainly based on 50, of course. You know, the amount of um, time, effort and, and cash that went into doing a brand new V12. So, you know, the basic uh, bore and stroke, the block, the crank, and the basic cylinder head castings are the same. But once again, Cosworth had a bit of a clean sheet of paper from the point of view of characteristic of the engine. And uh, knocking a thousand revs off the top is, is quite significant on, on a high revving engine with um, design, the design of the uh, combustion and the camshaft profiles and all that sort of stuff. So um, T50 already had a, an unbelievable starting point. In fact, when I started talking to Cosworth back at the end of 80, 2018 about the B12, um, I ended up with a very bad case of red face because I, I was an engine designer initially, so I should have known better. And um, it was about the, the engine revs when I first said to them, you know, could we have 12,000 revs? There was a lot of sucking of teeth and pregnant pauses. But they, they did come back quite quickly and say they thought they could do on valve springs they, with a four litre, they thought they could just get to 12, 12, one. And I thought, you know, when I grew up, you either, in the 60s, you either had revs and, and power or you had torque delivery and that was it. And there was, you know, the laws of physics said you, there was no way around that. Um, so I said to them right from the beginning, I'd like two modes. And I don't care if the sort of drop the kids off to school mode is only eight, nine, ten thousand revs. I, I really don't care. You know. Still pretty good. Uh, yes, still as good as anybody else, sort of thing. And um, they said you won't need it. Uh, but I did a bit of foot stamping and uh, insisted on it. And then, of course, when I saw the power, it's even before I drove the car, I saw the final power and torque curves for 50. And uh, I mean, it's just insanely torquey, the engine, low down, 70% of max torque at 2.5, you know. And now that I've driven T50, it's, it's just, I thought the F1 was my best engine for torque, V12 for torque delivery, um, and still is actually. Um, and being, you know, being six litres helps, of course, because it's proportional to the capacity. But, um, wow, the, the, I, the hill route at Millbrook, you're all, you know the hill route very well. Even the hairpin at the top of the hill. We'd just been benchmarking against a um, Porsche 911 GT3, the new one. Jumped out of 15, jumped into that. Uh, which is fair to be honest with it. They're both four litres I think, so yeah. And of course the Porsche's got nothing below 5,000 revs, absolutely nothing. Feels like a VW Golf, you know. And, uh, but six to nine, it's magic. Absolutely beautiful, screams up. But they've obviously sacrificed everything for that push from six to nine. Admittedly, it's supposed to be a sort of a track car. But, but then you jump into 50, I went round the hill route, changing gear like I had done in the, in the 911. And then it, it was ridiculously talky, so I left it in fifth gear and I went round the hill route in fifth, including the hairpin at the top. And that just shows you. So Cosworth having once again a clean sheet of paper, of course the building blocks of the engine are the same. They've, they've just worked their magic again. So just losing the thousand revs off the top has meant this has got 75% of max torque at 2.5, but much more mind-bogglingly, it's got 90% of max torque from 4.5 to 10.5, which is incredible for an engine that revs to 11,000, you know. Um, so they've done a magic job, and they've done that by obviously redoing the heads of it, um, new cams, new cam timing, of course. But it's also a brand new induction system, quite a different induction system from 50, and a very different exhaust system as well. 
So they've, they've used that and of course all their other tricks like twin port injection and their tumblers for combustion and, and they've worked their magic around that and got it even, even more drivable, you know, which is, you know, you don't need to be more drivable, but, but it is. So how has it changed with the, the induction then? Itself? It's just a completely different airbox. So on the on 50, we've got a, a settling chamber, a plenum chamber, and then four separate throttle bodies going into the ram induction box. On 33, I, I needed to keep the airbox narrower because the airbox unusually, we'll come back to that because it's really interesting, it's mounted directly to the engine and not connected to the chassis on this, so it, it moves independently. I've <laughs> always wanted to do that as well. Um, and it, it, this one, they've had to sort of bury the throttle bodies and a semi-plenum up, in, up inside the ram induction box, but we did a lot of work with them on the shape of the box and the airflow and the turbulence inside the, the air box. We did with 50 as well. Um, but it's very different from the 50 system. And of course, they've retuned the exhaust system completely too for the, for the different uh, motor. So presumably it's going to have a slightly different sound? I don't think so. No. I think it sounds, from what we've heard so far, because we, we're a year into the engine development for 33 already. Um, it's, just, it's just a T50 at 11. <laughs> and potentially in that case it's going to sound almost even better because you can sit, you're sitting to the side, because famously in the F1, the best place to sit for the sound was in one of the passenger seats. True, yeah. And of course we're still tuning the roof panels on 50, and we will on this as well, so you get the induction, the growl that you got on the F1. At the moment on 50, that's only starting at 4.5, the induction growl, which is a throttle opening thing. Um, whereas on the F1 it started lower than that, at 2.53. Um, so we've still got to tune the roof to maybe move that down the rev range a little bit. The airbox is, uh, is I've just I've always wanted to do that, just because you can, you know. So it's like a 70s Formula One car, where the airbox is literally bolted on the engine. On 50 and F1 and a lot of all the other cars that have a ram induction opening in the roof, it's part of the monocoque or the body. But on this, it's actually bolted to the engine. So at idle, you're going to see the, the airbox moving like one of those hot roddy front engined American cars with a supercharger sticking out the top, you know. Moving from engine, I'll stick with the drivetrain, I suppose, then, because we have a choice of gearboxes. Well, Gordon Murray mistakes. Um, I, I sat down with the team a couple of years ago because obviously, you know, we, we, we had to have something ready as the last 50S rolls off the line. We've got to keep the people busy. And we started talking about, as I said earlier, what we should do. Once we decided on a, a two-seat rear engine car, you know, I put forward, just, just to broaden the appeal a little bit, um, why don't we offer left or right-hand drive? Normally, under a few thousand cars, people don't do that because they, they're terrified of it. But actually, it's just intelligent design. If you design the mountings into the framework from the beginning, you know, it's, it's the same. At 50 and this car too, we have a seating buck and we offer different pedal positions. For it. Once it's designed in, it's not that big a deal with 100 cars, you know. So I said, well, why don't we offer left and right hand drive? And why don't we offer the option of a paddle shift? And, uh, you know, that will broaden the appeal. And there was a lot of muttering about, well, that's another few million quid on the development program and stuff. But I convinced everybody that we should do, we should offer it. We've been quietly pre-selling cars um, before the launch, like we did with 50. We sold it more than half the cars. And so far, there's only three people <laughs> that have picked a paddle shift. So egg on the face again. <laughs> so, um, so we could get to the 100 cars after the launch and only had a handful of people that are selected. Uh, I suppose it's because we advertise ourselves as, you know, driving perfection is our motto, if you like, and uh, we, we advertise ourselves as concentrating on nothing else but the driving experience. So I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. I just thought, I just thought it would be interesting uh, to offer a paddle shift. However, having said that, it's a brilliant paddle shift. It's the fastest road car gear change in the world. Um, there's zero uh, torque interrupt. It's very clever. It's, you know, other people boast about three milliseconds or five milliseconds. You know, this is nothing. <laughs> it's a pre-selector box. It's what they call an, an uh, IGS, instantaneous gear change system, I think they call it. And it's, um, it's a pre-selector. So the box, uh, as with all paddle shifts, the box, the software works out if you're going up or down the box or what gear you're going into. But let's assume you're going up the box and you're in second and you want third. 
it's already in both gears and then you just let go of second basically and it's, it's zero torque interrupt so it's, yeah so the fastest so once again we're breaking like like the t50 engine broke records with the fastest response the highest revs the big, uh, highest power density this this is <laughs> on the record books again and for you in terms of what what other things does that that bring in terms of offering a, a paddle shift it's sort of the things like i'm intrigued to know what your thoughts are on on a paddle shift itself in terms of because obviously the interaction of that's probably the mistake i made because we did we do seem to attract a very specific type of supercar buyer um, we, we've done an estimate with meeting them, which is great, the 100 cars, you get to meet everybody, you know. We, and we, we know a lot of the owners, of course. And Henry, our, our um, sales, uh, head of global sales, and myself, we reckon that 85 of the 50s, at least 85, are going to be used and used a lot, which is magic these days. And hopefully, this will be the same. And I just thought, broaden the appeal, you know, give people a paddle shift if they do want to do track days a lot, for example, because a manual is a paid on a track day. Um, it's the same system, to be fair, it is the same system we've used in 50S. Right. But for a, for a road car, it needs a lot more development because you don't mind if the gear change is a bit bangy, let's say, on a, on a track car. Moving away from drivetrain then to chassis, how is that differing to, because it's, it's so to T50? Once again, it's a completely different architecture. So with 50, um, the halo car, Again, it had a very, very specific monocoque for a central seat. You know, it's at the lightest, the best materials we could use. It's 107 kilos, <laughs> which is, and it's twice as stiff as an F1. <laughs> and the F1 was 135 kilos. That was never going to carry over anyway. But because we have to now think a bit more like a car company, that was our one off, you know. Uh, we have to think a bit more like a car company and this car will have three different variants so it's got a life cycle of three years. We need a platform that's a bit more adaptable and a bit more s stable from a long distance, a long time scale point of view sort of thing. So um, we've been developing in-house uh, a technology which is loosely based on our iStream but sort of upgraded massively for honeycomb carbon of course and uh, honeycomb carbon panels so what it is it's it's an aluminium frame that runs from front to rear but unlike other people who stop with a, a tub or a monocoque and bolt on the front and rear frames never really liked that very much because a bolted joint like that is always heavy complex and flexible actually so we've developed a very special system where if you imagine the front end that picks up the suspension and the crash structure is triangulated, as you would expect. As it passes through the cabin, it's continuous, but there's no triangulation. It's just four tubes, if you like, running through the cabin. And then it's triangulated again in the engine bay. And then we bond on high-performance honeycomb, aluminium honeycomb, carbon stabilized panels like a monocoque and form a monocoque around the middle bit, which gives you a safety cell, your torsional stiffness but doesn't have any bolted joints and it's and it's worked out really well in fact it's worked out so well we've done all the development down in unit 44 in dunsfold um, and we've got our own robot welding there and our own presses for the panels and things we're actually thinking about potentially making all the frames ourselves for 33 instead of putting it out uh, like we put the monocoque out for 50. All new suspension as well. Because it's still double wishbones all around, yeah. obviously, but, but explain the difference in... So the difference is once you go to a two-seater, you've got a much wider uh, front monocoque. So, of course, the T50's got much longer wishbones because very narrow monocoque in the, in the middle. So we had to redo the front end. Otherwise, I would have carried over the front end. The rear, um, the system is carried over. So we still have a semi-structural powertrain with our inclined shear axis system. That's all identical to 50. Different components, but the philosophy is the same. But once again, all the, all the actual components are different. So the wishbones are different, the uprights are different. Um, we just took the opportunity to do something that we could reproduce over a, over a sort of more easy, over a longer period, really. And anti-roll bar at the front, no anti-roll bar at the rear. 
just to explain to people because it's one of those things that sort of obviously the F1 famously doesn't have. Well, my Formula One cars never had rear anti roll bars. We were the only Formula One cars ever not to have rear anti roll bars. So explain why. Well, it's just it's know. just ridiculous, you know. When you look at the basic physics of of roll compensation in a motor car, um, you're you're trying to you're trying to stop uh, you're trying to stop the roll in in a corner. And you can, if you get your frequency balance and the, and the percentage, you don't go too crazy on the percentage of roll compensation that's coming from the roll bar, you can do it all at one end. The reason why I never do it at the rear is you go to all this trouble for traction, particularly in a racing car, funny enough, to get the, the best possible traction you can have with the best possible independent suspension. Not too much anti-squat, you know, otherwise you, you take away the feel and the, and the traction. Just the right amount of anti-squat. And then you join, you join the left and right hand axles with a, with a bar. It's, it's, it's nonsense. So on a one wheel bump, you know, coming out of a corner on, a, on roll or a one wheel bump, you're unloading one side of the car artificially, which is nonsense. You know. Not, if you want the best traction, you don't join the axles. I noticed in the press release there was a SVS sports Yes. Pack. So what was that? We're offering that on any car we build. So that is, um, I, I don't do, it's like I don't do cars with low ride heights. I don't do cars with stiff suspension. I would never like that. If you look at pictures of it, or you keep forgetting you've driven an F1. If you look at videos of an F1 on a track, it pitches and rolls all over the place. You know? And we offered what we called an LM pack on the F1, which had uh, different damper settings, bump rubbers, springs, ride heights a little bit more downforce as well. And so what we'll always offer is, is what we call an SV, so special vehicle uh, pack. Um, that is just stiffens the car up a little bit. So if people want to take the car to a track a lot or just like the car a bit more taut, if you like, um, we'll always offer that on any car we do, even on 50. You know, we're, got, we're going to be offering, if people, if they take delivery of the car and they go, it's, too comfortable, too soft. They can bring it back and we'll, we'll have a, a step up. Moving on to the aerodynamics, what I want to talk next. Um, obviously there's no fan on the rear of this. By accident we learned a lesson with the fan and once again I didn't want splitters and things on the car. I mean a 60s car with a big splitter sticking out of the front just isn't going to work is it? So we cheat a little bit. We've got two really big diffusers in the front wheel arch underneath which make Two thirds of the front downforce we need to balance the car. Can you just explain that? Because I think people are used to sort of the idea of diffusers at the rear of the car. Yeah, so you take a slug of air, you've got, if, if you're looking at the, the air approaching the car, you've got the slug of air that hits the front tyre, and then you've got the slug of air that goes under the monocoque, and then you've got the wheel arch. That wheel arch, um, the air coming under the front nose suddenly expands into the wheel arch. Um, if you control that expansion with the diffuser, the same way you do on the rear, you can generate downforce under the front part of the car, just ahead of that diffuser, and a little bit on the diffuser itself. So we've got two quite big diffusers, but they only make about two thirds of what we need to balance the car. Second point is our target wasn't as much downforce as 50, but the accident, the happy accident, was that in, in the middle of the hundreds of runs we were doing with this with dramatic diffuser on 50. I mean, I can't wait to show people, well, we're showing owners already, the actual component, I can't believe the air will follow that, you know. Um, it just jumps up literally from the kick point, about that high, and, and you switch the fan on and suck the boundary off and the air goes, you know, and you get instant downforce. When we switched the fan off with one of the profiles, we didn't lose all the downforce. We still kept about a third, so we went, well, hold on, what's happening here, you know? And we worked out it was the, um, because of course the, the fan and the ducts all, all end in the base suction. It's a cam tail like this, all end in the base suction behind the car. And the base suction behind the car, the low pressure, and the vortices and the low pressure is what helps any diffuser work. That low pressure helps pull the air through. That's why when you have a wing on a Formula One car and a higher base suction, the diffuser works better. Or whether you have an active spoiler, you can, kick the air up and more base suction. So uh, we thought, well, the duct itself is pulling air through from the base, enough to actually get the air to follow some of that profile. So we started again, and, and we looked at still step prof kick point and st step, 
steep profiles but much less aggressive and starting a little bit further back until we got one that worked just with the base suction. So we're getting about a 30% increase on what, on what I would call a standard ground effect car by still having the same technology but just don't have the fan and of course the fan you can have that at other speeds too which you can't this is absolutely car speed dependent now but it's fun because it does mean that with a steep kick point like that and a steep diffuser you make the downforce much further forward than you do with a gradual diffuser quite a long way half a meter or so which means once again we don't need anything on the front of the car to get the downforce figures so it all fell it was an accident though <laughs> Just run through a few of the other things. So wheels, very light wheels on this. Yeah, they are like 50. They're forged aluminium again. They're still carbon, carbon ceramic brakes, six pot front calipers, four pot, very similar. And once again, the tyres that you can buy anywhere, <laughs> the, the Michelin 4S, the Pilot 4S. Yeah. That's a fantastic all-round tyre, yeah. And the interior of the car, obviously we can't see it on, on this mm. buck here, but has that changed much? Not at all. There's nothing that's changed from a philosophy point of view and the driving experience. So once again, no touch screens, no column stalks, everything's aluminium, no plastic, uh, rotary primary and secondary control switches. And um, once again, everything clustered right around the driver, very driver focused. Um, the, the guys, the interior guys have done a great job of, of, of the interior, I have to say. It's, um, you're going to feel very special. The poor old passenger gets nothing, you know. Gets, the passenger gets an airbag. Um, so everything's right round the driver again. And of course, if you have the manual option, you've got the lovely little titanium gear change again. Luggage space is about the same as T50. Is it different though, is it? No, it's a lot more, it's actually. More, yeah, so 50 is already pr very good for a supercar, very usable. So uh, it was 220, I think, but it goes up if you have, we, are, we have a third option, if, if it's only two of you in the car, uh, an upside down suitcase in the, in the spare seat. Um, this has got 280 in three compartments. So there's a, con a very conventional one in the front, rear hinged, easy access, two big cases in there. Uh, much bigger than the usual little hole you get in a, a front engine, a frunk. Um, the rear, the rear ones are very much like 50 in the flanks of the car and they top load again. But we really struggled with uh, shot lines because we didn't want to run any extra shot. It's such a gorgeous muscle that, that across the rear wheel arch. We didn't want to interrupt that. So we got a very wacky opening. <laughs> where <laughs> so the doors, the doors are, the doors are dihedral. dihedral, yeah. Uh, but they're single hinge dihedral, not double hinge dihedral, so they don't break into the roof on this one, but they're dihedral. So the doors open, if you can imagine, like that. And then in the door jam, there's the release for the luggage. And the whole side of the car, literally from the B pillar to the tail light, swings open like suicide doors. And you top load. So you stand where the door was, if you like. And, and it, it sounds awkward, but it's not at all. We, we, mock, we mocked it up standing next to the car, you know. And you just drop the luggage in from the top. So there's two more cases each side. So there's six cases in total, 280 litres. And they will come with the car, presumably, like? Yeah, we'll build, we'll build special luggage for the car, for sure. Yeah. Everything that would stop people using the car every day, we try to get rid of. You know, and obviously like 50, it's got very low cost maintenance, very simple maintenance, long maintenance intervals, normal tyres, uh, the luggage space, the visibility. And the thing, of course, it has over 50 is the ingress, egress will always be easier than a central driving position. Not that 50 customers are complaining at the moment. They <laughs> Do you think there'll be many people that have a 50 little want one of these as well? Uh, the, the only people we've been out to for pre-sales are 50 owners, of course, and, and a group of people who ever since the launch of 50 have been in touch constantly about what we're doing next. And, and more than half the cars are gone already. Fantastic, Gordon, thank you very much. It's indeed. been a pleasure. <laughs> Hopefully that's given you an insight into the ethos of the T33. After talking to Gordon, I think much of it is born out of the realisation that they can build it. The success of the T50 has proved that there is a real appetite for the sort of cars that Gordon and his team want to build, even at the sort of prices they have to charge. So why not give the people what they want? Primarily, what Gordon wanted was for this to be a really pretty sports car 
and I think the result is stunning. It looks so simple in pictures, almost to the point of being unfinished, but walking round it, the shape is beguilingly clean, yet also muscular. I actually think that it was the same with the T50. The purity of these GMA designs makes them stand out in the 21st century. And they should be pretty good to drive too. Hopefully at some point, we'll get to find out. Hope you enjoyed that chat with Gordon and finding out a bit more about the T33. If you want to hear more of this, then just click on the link and please do subscribe to the Carfection YouTube channel. It really does help us and you don't want to miss out on any of the content that is coming up. So hit the bell notification icon as well. See you next time.